and I'll share my whiteboard and then uh, quickly review what we had learned last time. So basically last time we uh, started working with these master equations and our master equations are, oops, black. Delta X equals the initial T plus one half a t squared b final equals v initial plus a t and some of you for extra credit proved from the first two equation that b final squared equals v initial squared plus two a delta x and so these three equations i'm just going to kind of keep them in a box for us to refer to um, whenever you know whenever we need an equation those are the three master equations for the contest tomorrow um, basically every problem will either involve you know the graphing work that we were doing where we look at a graph and um, you know find the, the average velocity in an interval or the instantaneous velocity or they will be word problems similar to what we did yesterday where we use these three master equations so today we're just going to keep practicing with the master equations and in particular practicing how to read and translate a word problem because that is really the key to the whole class, uh, not just this chapter, but um, you know the ability to read a, a problem expressed in English and translate it into a math problem. And even if you think math is what you don't like, um, I think what you're going to find is it's the English that you really don't like. And once you get to a math problem, you know, you are able to handle it. So um, let me talk about the three equations and, and sort of when we use each one. And then um, we're, we'll get back to practicing. So the first equation you can think of it as designed to find the displacement. However, we could solve for any of these variables. We might need to solve it for the time, for example. Um, we might need to solve it for the acceleration or the initial velocity. It really just depends on what you're given. So there's one variable that's kind of conspicuously absent from the first equation, and that's v final. So if the information given is v in, involves v final, you probably don't want the first equation. OK, sometimes it's better to look what's missing in the equation. In the second equation, the absent variable is delta x, a displacement. So if our if our information given is delta x or if we're looking for delta x, then probably we don't want the second equation. And the variable missing in the third equation is the time. So if you see a problem and the time is never mentioned, it's a very good indicator that you're going to want this third master equation. Um, now. I want to point out that in all of these equations, the acceleration is necessary. Okay, we cannot solve a problem if we don't have the acceleration. If we're given if we're given information and no information about acceleration, our only possibility would be to solve one of these equations for the acceleration and then use that number to solve for something else. Um, so that gives a big limitation. Additionally, remember all of these equations are only valid if the acceleration is constant. So in every problem we do, we should be thinking about the acceleration. And if something funny is going on with the acceleration, we, we have to be on top of it. So if the acceleration changes in the middle of the problem, something's doing one thing and then its acceleration changes, we have to be aware of that. Um, secondly, Sometimes the acceleration is only implied. It's not given. It's never stated. And there's one very special situation that just has to do with us being on Earth. If we weren't on Earth, it would be different. Or if we lived on a, a planet that wasn't a sphere, it would be different. But it's kind of an experimental fact. I encourage you to try this at home. If, I, if we were live in the classroom, I would demonstrate this for you. But if I drop an object, anywhere on Earth, it's going to have a certain acceleration. And it does not matter how heavy that object is. So um, if I, what I normally do is I take the, the, my dry erase marker 
and I have like the cap of the marker and the marker and I drop them both at the same time and they both hit the ground at the same time. So I encourage you to try that with some objects in your house. You can drop like a light object, like a paper clip and a book or something. And the book is probably 100 or 500 times as heavy as the paper clip, but if you drop them, they both accelerate at the same rate. So this is just an experimental fact on Earth and it's not an obvious one for a long time um, really until Galileo, I think, is the first person to actually test this. But Aristotle had said that heavier objects fall faster, and that makes sense until you actually observe it. But actually, all objects fall at the same rate unless there's air resistance. So if there's air resistance, that changes things, and that's why a feather falls more slowly than a bowling ball. Um, but for our purposes, we... Oops, Go back to black here. We are going to recognize that the acceleration, if we drop something, if we drop something, if something is in the air, it doesn't matter drop or throw or kick or toss or shoot or hurl, any of those words that indicate in English that something is in the air, only being acted upon by gravity then we have a certain number, and that number on Earth is minus 9.8 meters per second squared. So this is known as the acceleration due to gravity. Now we have a special symbol for it. We use the symbol G because we like using symbols. And the G, we, when we see this symbol, we name this thing acceleration due to gravity. That is the name of this symbol G. It is positive 9.8 meters per second squared. So this is a little confusing because the symbol G is the positive number. It's called the acceleration due to gravity. But the actual value of acceleration that we use when we when we are solving equations would basically be minus this symbol G. Okay, so this minus sign causes a lot of people trouble. Let me explain why there's a minus sign in the acceleration in the first place. Imagine we're graphing something and um, maybe I just drop kick uh, a ball, okay? So at the moment it leaves my foot, maybe it's one meter off the ground and it's gonna go up. It's going to go up a while, and then it's going to come down, and it's going to bounce a couple times. So this would be the graph of the motion if I just kick a ball straight up in the air, okay, straight up in the air. It's going to go up to some max height, and then it's going to come back down. And look at the shape of this curve. It is sad. Okay, so that means the acceleration is less than there. It's always a negative number. So the acceleration, remember, is a vector. It has a direction, and the direction of that vector is down, okay? The acceleration is a vector. It has a direction. Its direction is down, and that downness is why the, this curves downward. If we had something that would speed up when you kick it, it goes up, and it gets faster and faster, that would be a positive acceleration, but gravity doesn't work that way. When we kick balls, they don't start speeding up. As they get higher and higher, they start slowing down. Eventually, they reach their maximum height, and then they start speeding up on the way down. So um, we have to be kind of careful about the signs of this. And this is further, you know, confused by the fact that our, our problem books are not always consistent on this. Some of the books, some of the problems, say, they, they don't even say it, they just do it. They do a trick where they say, let's call down positive. Normally, we're gonna call up positive and down negative. They say, well, let's call down positive. And so then they, they use positive 9.8 for the acceleration. I'm gonna really strongly encourage you not to do that. And remember, when you're solving problems, you really shouldn't be looking at the solution until you finish the problem. If you do, look at them too soon, it's actually going to confuse you more. So we're gonna get some practice with this today. 
But the key is when I'm reading the problem, if there's any indication that this is something that's flying through the air, they're never going to come out and give us a number for acceleration. We're just expected to know it. And on your equation sheet on the contest, if you look on Blackboard, see a preview of that equation sheet, I give you this number, G equals positive 9.8 meters per second squared. But you have to know when you're solving a problem. We're going to practice it today. But you have to know when you're solving a problem that the acceleration would be negative G. OK, um, any questions about that, that issue of acceleration due to gravity? OK, well, um, let's get started with some problems. So we're going to start with um, we're, we're not yet going to do a problem with G because I had one more problem um, kind of left over from last that we didn't get to. And that problem, we're still in the 3,000 problems book. The reason I'm using the 3,000 problems book primarily right now to practice problems is because most of the, the good problems that cover this kind of stuff in the college physics book I assigned to you, and I didn't assign that many from this. So there's kind of extra problems available. OK, so this is problem 3.17 in the 3,000 problems book. And I'll read it out loud in English. And then again, we're going to translate it from English into math. And that is the key you know, skill that we still need to develop. A rocket propelled car starts from rest at x equals 0 and moves in the plus direction of x with constant acceleration a equals 5 meters per second squared for 8 seconds until the fuel is exhausted. So let's that's a lot of stuff going on. First of all, it says starts from rest. And I would write starts from rest as v initial equals 0. At x equals 0. So it's starting at x equals 0. Now, we haven't had to do this before. But what I would say is this indicates x initial equals 0. We don't really have an x initial in our master equations. But we do have delta x, which is x final minus x initial. So they're kind of giving us information that relates to delta x. Um, it goes positive direction of x with constant acceleration of a equals 5 meters per second squared. So we can write down a equals 5 meters per second squared for 8 seconds until the fuel is exhausted. So t equals 8 seconds. Now, until the fuel is exhausted, I don't really know how to write that as a mathematical sentence, but I conceptually think what's happening is the acceleration is on for a while and then it shuts off. Okay, when we run out of fuel, we can't keep speeding up. This is a you know this is a rocket, a rocket car. It then continues with constant velocity. So what I said at the beginning, we have to be really careful about the acceleration. This acceleration is constant for a while, and then it turns off. It becomes zero because it says it goes constant velocity after this time. So what it means is I have to split this into a part A and a part B. Anytime the acceleration changes, I have to sort of reset, and it's a new part. So this is V initial for A and x initial for a, and acceleration for a, and the time for a, part a. And then, well, then there must be some part b. It says it then continues with constant velocity. What distance of the car cover in 12 seconds? So we can do the same thing we did last time and kind of make a graph of this and um, use that to help us identify what is half, where is part A and where's part B? So the first half, does anyone, why don't you try to draw a picture, a graph of the first half on your own paper? 
you should really have paper. You shouldn't just watch these videos. You should be taking notes just like a regular class because you encode it better when you're taking notes, when you're writing it down. There's tons and tons of research that says that. So I hope you have you know, paper out and pencil to write with. So go ahead and try to draw what that graph, for part A only, this is my time, TA, what that's going to look like. Does anybody want to um, try to draw what that looks like? I'll go ahead and draw axes. Anyone want to take a crack at drawing what the first part of the graph looks like? No? Come on, somebody, be bold. Be brave. Draw on the board. Okay, all right. I see, I see how it is. So uh, let's let's go through this. It starts off at x initial being zero. So that means it starts. Remember, we have x up here. Why is it not? My pen is not not drawing. So, hmm. Give me a second, I'm having a little technical difficulty with my, it's like writing 15 seconds after I, I do stuff. Okay, so we have the x-axis there, the t-axis there. If we're starting at x equals zero, we're at time equals zero, we're at the origin, and then we the initial velocity is zero, that means it starts off flat, okay? It's starting off flat, but it is accelerating with a positive acceleration, so it looks happy. Something like this. Okay? Now, I don't know how curvy it is. It doesn't really matter. It's just the fact that it curves. So from eight seconds on, though, it just goes in a straight line. So I feel like I kind of ran out of little space. So I'm going to redraw that. Just uh, not going so high. Just only so that I can make a, a clear four seconds of straight line there. Okay, that wasn't that clear of a four seconds. I'm, so, I'm sorry, my pen is, is giving me a lot of trouble, so I'm just going to kind of reset it a little bit. It'll take a minute. Let me see, just,
Okay, um, I think hopefully that's better. Sorry about that. So let's see. We get a nice. Not seeing a line. Okay, looks like it's working. So we have a, a curve there for a while, and then it just goes exactly straight after that. Sorry about that. So um, my TB, I have two choices, just like that problem we had that kind of split in the middle. I think this time we can, you can't see the whiteboard. Okay, let me. Um, okay, can you see that now? Okay, great. So uh, we have kind of a curve and then a straight line. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to identify my TB as just this other time period. Now, this time I really have to do it this way because the acceleration changes at the eight second mark. So I really want to keep those two time intervals separate and not have them overlapping. OK, if they're overlapping, <coughs> then I, I can't really be consistent on the acceleration. For part B, we would say AB equals 0. And V initial for B, the initial speed of part B would have to be whatever is the final speed of part A, even though we don't know what that is. That's just how it works when you, you know, have one time interval and another one that follows it. Uh, in the same way, the x initial for B will be the x final for A. And what else does it say? It says it basically four more seconds. So we have a TB equals four seconds. And the final question is, what distance does the car cover in 12 seconds. So we really are looking for x final b because that's going to be here x final b where x final a just only is how far it goes during that first segment. Okay, so this is my full translation. And I want to I want to steal the equations from the other page just so that we can see them. OK, so we have those equations, and we're ready to go. Now, when, once I've done the translation, I am very um, I don't put a whole lot of thought necessarily all the time into which equation, you know, how I'm going to solve this whole thing. I just take it one step at a time. So I know x final b equals question mark. I know that's what I'm looking for. So I look at my equations and I say, you know, where does that thing appear? Well, the final position is part of the delta x. So I'm looking at either equation 1 or equation you know, three. Now I can use either one. Um, I can use either one, but equation one looks just a little bit better to me because it's already had the algebra done to solve for delta x. But in principle, in principle, this is the good news, the best news you're going to get all, all week. It does not matter which equation we pick. Every equation will work. It just is a matter of which way is a little easier and which way is a little harder. OK, and this is a great comfort when you're working and you feel like, oh, God, I don't know how to solve this problem. Don't worry. Just start working and you're going to see that it just there's really not a lot of choices to be made once we start working. So I'm going to pick the first equation. Um, delta X equals the initial T plus one half a T squared. And I'm going to put little B's on everything. And then we'll check what we know. 
So do we know V initial B? Well, we, we don't have a number, but this says we know it if we know V final for A. So I look up here and I don't know V final for A. So the answer is no, I don't know V initial for B. Do I know TB? Well, I look up here and I see, yes, I do. So I'm gonna underline, I know it. Do we know acceleration B? Yes, we do. Now, let me come back to that. Can someone say how I know acceleration B equals zero? What is it that told me? What's the English that said acceleration B equals zero? Constant velocity, Daniel, that's right. So because it's constant velocity in part B, that means acceleration B is zero, and I can just cross it out, and everything that's attached to it then also gets crossed out. So this is perfect. Now, delta B, that's really X final B minus X initial B. So in this case, I also need to check, do I know X initial for B? And again, looking up here, I know that the initial position for B is the final position for A. And I come up here and I don't know the final position for A. So what this does is it tells me I need to find these two things. So rather than being a problem, this is actually a feature. I am now being told by the equation, yes, I can find X final B if I first find V initial B and X initial B. So if I look here, that tells me I need to go back to part A, find these two initial things about part B. Okay, great. So we're, we just keep moving. There's really, you know, it's like a guidepost that tells us wh which way to go. So I want to find V initial for, for part B, which is V final for part A. So I go up here and look, what do I know? I know the acceleration. I know the time. I know the V initial and I want the V final. So if I look at my equations, I can use either equation two or equation three, but equation two looks a little better because I don't know delta x for part A, so I don't want to use equation three. If I did use equation three, it would be okay. I would just find out I have to find delta x. I'm just picking that one, but again, if I pick the wrong one, it just means a little bit longer path, but every path leads to the answer. So now I check, um, again, this is, I should write little a's, on everything and we're just going to check do we know v initial for part a look up here yes i do it's zero i can cross it out do i know acceleration for part a yes i do do i know t for part a yes i do so can i solve for v final for part a yes i can so v final a is five times eight and that's going to be 40 meters per second. And that means the initial for B is also 40 meters per second. So perfect. Okay, one, one of them down, one more to go. So now I need to find X initial B, which means I need an equation that has delta X. So X initial for B is X final for A. Well, basically, I now know initial velocity for A, final velocity for A, acceleration for A, and T for A. So I know everything except delta X. So I can easily find it. I'll just pick the first equation. It really, either one would get me there. Delta X equals V initial T plus one half AT squared. And these are all for part A, and we go through and we, we know V initial 
is zero, so I can cross out that whole term. And I know acceleration A and TA. So this is X final for A minus X initial for A, and that's just equal to one half acceleration A TA squared. And keep in mind, X initial for A is zero, and we know all of that stuff. So X final for A is just one half times five times eight squared. Um, I think that looks like about 160. So maybe check me out with your calculator. 160 meters. Anybody get that? Or get something else? You got that, Haley? Okay, great. So we're ready to complete this because we now know both X initial for B and V initial for B. So just take that equation, X final B minus X initial B equals V initial B TB. And we're going to solve for X final B. By moving the X initial B to the other side, and then we can plug in our numbers. We have 160 plus 40 times 4, which is another 160. So that, oops, that looks like... 320 meters. Okay. All right. So what is this problem illustrating? You know, what makes it different? There's two, two things. One is that because the acceleration changes in the middle, that means my graph, it doesn't just stay curved. It goes from curved to straight. Or if it curved and then it curved a little more or a little less because the acceleration changed, I have to let it into two parts. You can call them part A, part B. You can call them part one, part two, whatever, you know, makes it easy for you to, you know, to conceptualize it. And the second thing is that I didn't really have enough information. When I picked my equation to find X final, I didn't have enough information, but that's okay, because whatever information you're missing is sort of an instant. It's just like the problem is telling you what's the next step. And you can continually follow this procedure, and it will always work. So we'll see that, you know, throughout the semester as we go. Now, any questions about uh, any parts of this problem? No questions? Okay, well, let's try another problem. Now, the next problem is going to involve the acceleration due to gravity. So this is problem 3.24. I'm just going to get my master equations on the screen again, just for convenience. And uh, let's read this together. An anti-aircraft shell is fired vertically upward with an initial velocity of 500 meters per second. So translating into math, V initial equals 500 meters per second. Now, what's the relevance of it saying fired vertically upward? How do I incorporate vertically upward into my math sentence? Anyone have an idea how that how that kind of comes into play? Haley? Is um is that when we use the G or the negative nine point eight? 
Well, we use we will use it in this problem, but not not because it says fired vertically upward. It would also be true if we fired it vertically downward that we would use the minus g. Any other ideas? So there's a difference between firing something vertically upward and firing it vertically downward. And how would I mathematically say it if we were firing it vertically downward? Tommy? You would use a positive sign, would you? Right. So I use a positive sign here for upward. And therefore, for net, for if we were shooting it downward, we would put a minus sign. Correct. Yeah, so that's exactly right. Now, we we don't normally write positive signs when something's positive, but I like to do it when I'm translating because it kind of reminds me that I paid attention rather than that I just had an oversight. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Any questions? Okay, so um, so V initial equals plus 500 meters per second means it was fired vertically upward with a speed of 500 meters per second. Um, now, it says neglecting friction. So neglecting friction and the fact that it's in the air tells us that acceleration equals minus G. I'm just gonna say minus G and I'm gonna keep that G in my equation and at the very end, that G is going to be replaced by 9.8. Now, we want to find the mass height that it reaches. So this is kind of initial information. And then part A says, find the max height. How do I say mathematically that I want to find the max height? This is a little tricky. So which variable would relate to the height? I'll give you five guesses. Tommy, are you wanting to say something? Yes, I was thinking that it, uh, it would be like, almost like asking the displacement. Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're basically being asked delta x equals question mark, but there's more to it because we don't want the displacement. It has different displacement all the time. Every second the displacement is changing. So we need the displacement when something happens. Something happens that tells us mathematically that it's the max height instead of the height after one second or two seconds. So how would we say we're at the max height mathematically? Anyone? Okay, let's make a graph and see if that helps us. So uh, go ahead and see if you can draw what the graph of this thing looks like. You fire something straight up, it's gonna go up and then it's gonna come back and hit the ground you know, eventually. We should see something like that, right? Just a, a U, an, un, an unhappy curve. It's sad all the time because the acceleration is always negative, not just negative on the way down, it's also negative when it's on the way up. The whole flight, the acceleration is negative. Now, how do I say, looking at this graph, what feature tells me I'm at the top, that I'm at the highest point? This is, this is tricky, especially the first time you see it. Does anyone have any ideas? Just throw them out there if you have an idea. Would it be when the velocity is equal to zero? Absolutely. Tell me why you th you're seeing that. Uh, once the velocity reaches zero, uh, then it starts to go negative, which brings it 
back down to earth. That so, makes... yeah, ex exactly. So we get sort of a flat spot at the top, right, where the tangent line is, is flat. And after that, the tangent line becomes negative, And that's what brings it back down. So exactly. When we hear, see, this is how bad English is. When we read maximum height, we are supposed to translate that as v final equals zero. But it doesn't sound like it means that, you know, when you listen to the English. But that's what it means. Final velocity is zero, not when the shell hits the ground. If that were true, nobody would fire shells. You know, <laughs> what, let's see, it's an anti-aircraft shell, right? It's, when it hits the ground, if it hits a tank or something, it's moving fast. It's very steep here. In English, we, we tend to want to say the velocity is zero when it lands, but really the velocity is zero at the top. And that's why it doesn't keep going up. Okay, so good. This is tricky but the first time we see it, but we're going to see that kind of thing a lot. And getting to the top, reaching the highest point, those kind of words in English will mean something about the velocity. Okay, well, um, let's see if we can... Maybe we're, we're missing something, but maybe not. Let's see if we have enough information to, to solve this. I want to find delta x, and I've been given information about uh, v initial, v final, and acceleration. Do any of my equations look like they would be good candidates to solve for delta x given what we know? The ad? The second one? What about the second one uh, do you like for finding delta x? I mean, it does have uh, v initial in there, so that's useful. And then v of f is equal to zero, so we can use that as well, right? Yeah, that's true. Tell you what. Hold that, hold that thought, Tommy. I'm going to do a little poll. I'm going to do a poll and see what you guys are thinking. Um, so we're just going to do which equation do you think you should use? And we'll, we'll use whichever one gets the most votes. And, and in fact, we can use any any equation, but let's see what's the most popular. Go ahead and pick uh, which one you like the most. There's no right answer, just which one you like the most. I know which one I like the most. I want to see which ones you like the most. Need two more votes. Okay, two people are in the bathroom, I'm assuming. Okay, so we've got uh, 10 votes here, three votes there, and zero votes there. Now, I'm, I'm surprised equation one didn't get more votes because, I mean, it says delta x equals. It looks... This is often the one I think that a lot of students like to choose for this problem. Um, and then, you know, I'm not surprised about equation three because it also has delta x. Now, equation two, delta x doesn't appear in this equation. So we cannot solve it directly and get delta x, but we could use it to, to discover time and then use that time in equation one. So, we could use any of these as a starting point, but I think number most people are seeing number three, and I agree, that's the one that I picked as well. So um, let's, let's try it out. Uh, oops. V final squared equals V initial squared plus two A delta X. And by the way, the reason I like this equation the most is because we didn't get the time and this equation doesn't need time so that's why i like it the most and it has delta x in it 
Then we check if we know everything. Do we know V final? Yes, and it's zero. Do we know V initial? Yes. Do we know A? Yes. How about two? Yes. So can we solve it? Absolutely. So um, I'm going to rearrange this to solve for delta x. And that means first, move anything that's not attached, like this v initial squared, to the other side by subtracting. OK? And the next algebra step would be to move anything that is attached to my variable, the delta x. Move that to the other side by multiplying or dividing. In this case, I'll divide by 2a. So we have minus v initial squared over 2a equals delta x. And so delta x um, is minus v initial squared over 2 times negative g. So I'm putting negative g in for the acceleration. And the reason I'm doing that is because now these minus signs are going to cancel. And what I have is a formula. If we wanted to do this a lot, this we could think of this as a maximum height formula. All you need to know is the initial speed and what planet you're on, and I can tell you how high something will go. That's pretty impressive. Just tell me the initial speed, what planet you're on, and I'll tell you how high it goes. That's what we just figured out here. And so we can say delta x equals putting in our numbers 500 squared over 2 times 9.8. And let me see what I get. Tommy? Yes, sir. I don't have the book yet. So uh, what you have negative G there for, uh, and then you went ahead and put 9.8 is the book. Uh, or in the sentence, is it saying that the uh, acceleration is 9.8? No, th that's this thing I was talking about before, that anywhere on Earth, mm -hmm. that's the value. That's okay. just an experimental number, and the, the problem will never tell us that. So that's where we have to read between the lines. If we uh -huh. see it's in the air, it's thrown, it's kicked, it's dropped, it's hurled, it's tossed, it's flung, any of those words in English that make you imagine this thing is flying through the air, then we just have to infer that the acceleration due to gravity is going to be minus 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, gotcha. Sure. And actually, just for you know trivia's sake, it, it varies across the surface of the Earth from about 9.78 to about 9.83, depending where you are on the Earth. But it's always rounding to 9.8. So, and it's it's negative again because it points down because gravity also points down. Um, okay, so I got here um, 12,755 meters. Did anybody else get the same thing? Yes, I did. Okay, great. So that's the answer to the question, how high it goes, which is why they're using it on aircraft. That's pretty high. Um, okay, so the next part says, this would be part B. Again, I'm using capital letters because I don't like using lowercase a when I have lowercase a for acceleration. B says the time taken to reach that height. So that's going to be, you know, the time equals question mark. And here's a, an interesting thing. And a problem like this with multiple parts, they may ask us different questions about different things. So it's nice to label in your picture where is the initial point and where is the final point. So for both part, for part A, the final point is the top. For part B, the final point is also the top. And that means that we can, they share information. They, they have the same initial and final stuff as each other, parts A and B. So I don't have to split this into two different parts. And I know the V initial is still whatever it was at the beginning, and the acceleration is the same, and now I even know delta X. So we want to find the time. 
we can find the time using equation one or using equation two. Um, let's have another vote. So who, which equation do you want to use? Equation one or equation two to solve for time? All right, uh, looks like nine people. Come on. We have two people want to use equation one. And nine people want to use equation two. I knew you guys wanted to use equation two. I had that sense. Um, someone tell me why you want to use equation two. Anybody, since it's so popular? Want to say why why it's so popular? Tommy? It's simple. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's a simpler equation, right? So if there's a hard equation and an easy equation and they both do the job, you know, nine times out of ten, you're going to prefer the simple equation. I think it would be good to see how to do it with both ways, though, because, you know, you might pick the, the wrong one. Neither one is wrong, but you might pick the harder one and you want to know how to solve it. Um, let's solve it using equation two first, though. So we have v final equals v initial plus at. And again, we check what we know. v final we know is zero. v initial is given and a is given. And so we can absolutely find the time. We just subtract the thing that's not attached. That's the V initial. Subtract it from both sides. And then we divide by the piece that is attached, which is my acceleration. And um, then we have T equals minus V initial over minus G. And those minus signs cancel out. And we just solved now a formula for time of flight. Actually, this is time to the top. So time of flight, we will see is double this time to the top. But um, the initial is 500 and G is positive 98. I want to stress that again. The G symbol, when we see that in a formula, is a positive number. I already used the minus sign in my equation and it wound up canceling out. And so uh, finally, the, the number is going to be like, you know, a little more than 50. It's like 51 seconds. So that's how it takes to get to the top. Any, um, any questions about that? Okay, uh, let's see how we would use the first equation to solve that. So we have delta x equals v initial t plus one half a t squared. And we check what we know. We do know to x because we solved it um, in the first part. We know v initial. We know the acceleration. We know one half. So we know everything in this equation except for t. So how do we solve it for t? It's hard, right? It's hard to see what to do. The reason it's hard is because you guys all have solved an equation just like this in math class. Not only once, but probably a hundred times. But it's hard to recognize it in physics class. In math class, this problem would look like this. It would look like, uh, you know, one, two, oh, I need, I need to go to black. Um, one, two, let me see what that number for delta x was. One, two, seven, five, five equals 500 
t minus 4.9 t squared. Actually, the 4.9 is because it's 9.8 divided by 2. That's 4.9. Or they don't use such weird numbers in math class. They would give you an equation like this. 2x squared plus 3x minus 4 equals 0. Okay? That's what it looks like in math class. This is what it looks like in physics class if you put numbers in. And this is what it actually looks like in physics class. You can see a big gap between, you know, what you're going to see in physics versus what it looked like when you learned how to do it. Does anyone remember how to solve this thing in the box from math class? Come on, I know so, some of you told me you haven't had math in a long time, so I understand. But some of you have had math recently. No? Anyone? Bueller? Okay, so exactly. Katarina says the quadratic formula. That's that formula that you memorized in school and you would wake up like sweating, saying negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Or maybe you have a song. Some of you probably memorized a song to learn that. But, you know, minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. This quadratic formula, uh, that is also included on your equation sheet because I recognize some of you may not have been doing that for a while, but you will have to do it sometimes because master equation number one is a quadratic equation. If you know everything, if you're solving it for time, it's a quadratic equation. So, what I would recommend is we take this version in this box on the top, since I have the numbers in, and you probably remember um, what the A, B, and C stand for. Um, but in case you don't, let me rewrite the equation. You want to put everything on this. This is T squared plus 500T minus 1,270. 12,755 equals zero. You want to put it all on one side, and then the piece that is attached to the squared variable is called A. The piece that's attached to the, you know, the variable that's not squared is called B. And the piece that's connected, you know, that's a constant number is called C. And any minus signs become part of that, that constant. So plugging that in my quadratic formula, I'm going to get minus 500 plus or minus the square root of 500 squared minus 4 times minus 4.9 times uh, minus 1 minus 12,755 and all of that is going to be over 2 times minus 4.9 all right um, and if you do if you do all of that stuff what you're going to find out is this thing turns out to be equal to zero if you plug in all those numbers. And so you're going to get minus 500 over minus 9.8, and that's going to give you 51 seconds. Okay? So I agree with all of you that equation number two was better than equation number one. However, we do not want to... Uh, avoid equation number one because sometimes we will need to use that. We will need to solve it. Okay. Any questions about those two uh, two methods? I'm going to leave this as sort of a, you know, I don't know, maybe an example you can look back at when the next time you're solving quadratic equations uh, at home. But I won't. I'm going to think of this as the better approach for solving this problem. Any questions?
Okay, so uh, it's been about an hour. Normally, you know, after um, you know, after solving the quadratic equation, you might find yourself needing a stiff drink or something. So go ahead and take a break um, for about five minutes. When we come back, we'll finish this problem.